Hello, hello everyone. Book club number 24, let's do this. Come on in, tell me where you're signing in from, how you are. Hi guys, come on in. The birds are chirping and I know that sounds so cliched, but it's so stunning to hear them probably mating and wanting a mate, but um, I will call it just chirping and it just sounds so lovely in the spring. Okay guys, welcome. We're talking about my book, book club number 24. So um, Radical Awakening, I've shown it so many times now I'm getting tired of showing the book. You know what it is. If you haven't bought it till now, what can I say? So if you haven't bought it right now, at least listen into this talk. So a, a big theme of the book is how to reclaim your inner power. Yes, I've said that a thousand times. And why is that so essential? Like, okay, big deal. Why do we need to reclaim our inner power? She tells us about this every damn day. Well, because absent this reclamation of power is an abduction of spirit. If we are not in our own power, then who is? Invasions by culture is. Invasions by other people's unconsciousness is. Invasions by other people's tantrums. Other people's lack of growing up is. And we are left directionless. So reclamation of power may sound like a cliche, but it's really what this whole book is about. It is a process to reclaim your inner power. So we are on book club number 24, talking about my book of Radical Awakening. So reclamation of power has certain ingredients in it. And, you know, everyone wants to be powerful, but we don't want to do the work to get there. It's a mother of work, okay? It's like, it's the onus is gargantuan. But if you're willing to take the onus, go through the tunnel of change and transformation, the burning hells of your um, shedding, your releasing, your dying to your old selves, then at the other end is this thing that I call a reclamation of self. So it takes certain steps. You can't just sit there and ideate. You can't just sit there and want, right? You have to do the work, right? And everyone asks me, well, what is the work? What is the work? Well, it's hard to say in a one, two, three. You know, the first step is always to be asleep, of, to be awake to the ways you've been asleep. That's my standard answer. If somebody asks me, how do I do this? You know, I've just learned to have a standard answer. Well, it's kind of hard, but in a nutshell, you have to first become aware that you've been asleep and go buy my book, go read my book, go take my courses, go take other courses, and then you can evolve, right? So there are steps to do this, just like there are steps to eat healthy, there are steps to reduce inflammation, uh, and a lot of it is genetic. So, so sorry, a lot of your psychological bullcrap is genetic, meaning, it was there by the time you were five. It was in the air you breathe as a toddler. I'm sorry, you know, it was part of your nurture nature uh, equation. So we have to accept that, damn it, you know, I, the, the, I was about to fly over that house and I, the damn stalk dumped me in this garden. Okay, so you got this garden, what to do? It is what it is. Right? We cannot bemoan our past. We cannot bemoan our childhood. Almost every human's childhood has been royally effed up, okay? By totally unconscious parents to the point where you're going, what on earth? Did your parents really do that? It is inconceivable. It is unbelievable. And I shake my head every damn day, many times a day, when I hear stories, when I observe parents. Not that I'm so fancy as a parent. I am way out of control many times, but not that much out of control. So we were all raised with a high degree of lunacy and some serious mental illness. And we have to accept it, okay? Blame the stork. You know, it got tired holding you in its beak and dumped you. What the hell? Hate birds for the rest of your life. But... You cannot keep resenting your childhood. 
You know, you aren't unluckier for getting these psycho parents. You aren't. I'm so sorry to say. Everyone's life will have huge amounts of neuroses coming their way. I thought I escaped it because I had such amazing parents. It's okay, Shafali. You're going to get your share when you grow up. And I have gotten my share when I grew up. So here or there, through this or that, everyone is going to encounter the unconsciousness of this dimension. So please do not have a mythical, mystical fantasy that you have been chosen as the bad one. You have been chosen as poor, poor you. No, become a therapist and you'll see every single human you meet. And if you take that as a sample of the greater population, has been royally effed by somebody or the other, maybe several people in their lives. Nobody in their 40s escapes some real devilish lunacy of either their parents, their siblings, or their friends, or their bosses. So please do not have this idea that it's you. I know because of the horrors you may have experienced or how sensitive you are, you feel only you are going through this. I'm so sorry to say, no, this is a rampant problem. Now, some go up, some have it more, some have it less. It doesn't matter. We cannot compare our traumas. Okay, people always compare each other's traumas. Well, were you molested by the butcher's brother when you went to buy meat at the local store? <laughs> and eaten by the dog on the way home? And, you know, sprained your ankle when you were about to tell your mom and then your mom was depressed so you couldn't tell her. Okay, like, sorry, you are not unique in that way. In that way, we all share a common human load, which is our exposure to each other's unconsciousness. Okay, I don't mean to be unsympathetic. I just mean to quell your idea that you're the only one. Because it was traumatic to you, you feel, yes, who else is going through this? But let me tell you, as a therapist, I've been doing this since I was 22 years old and I'm 49. I have seen it all. And not a single person who's entered my office has ever told me something that I said back to them. Wow, what a childhood. What an amazing childhood. Said Dr. Shivali, never. Okay, never have those words come out of my mouth. I'm always just in deep sympathy, deep empathy, deep shock, and sometimes incredulous horror. Okay, so if you're sitting there thinking that you have the particular dibs on bad luck and extra parental lunacy, no, I'm sorry. You got it bad, definitely but millions of others have it bad too. This is why I do the work I do. I will not stop till I die, I promise you, because I'm so passionate about shedding light on how pernicious unconscious parenting is. This is why I do the work, because I'm so moved every day. And I'm like these damn parents, right? So I, I try to help parents, but then I see parents and I see their parents have messed them up. And then the generational trauma just gets passed on and on. Okay, so the first step is to understand you're not alone. So sorry you got dropped in that garden. So sorry you got that crazy family. It is what it is. Now, what do we do with it, right? Now we begin to reclaim the self. So what does reclaiming the self look like? It looks like really becoming aware of your particular life narrative. How has your life narrative played itself out? Don't look there. Don't look at Sally down the road. Don't look at Doug across the street. Do not compare yourself even to your own sibling. You know, do not compare yourself to your own sibling. When I talk to my brother, I'm telling you, it's like we grew up in different houses. You know, my father was a different father with him, a different father with me. And I saw this when I was five years old. I'm like, why is my dad different to my brother? than he is to me because different expectations, gender expectations, different dynamics, different chemistry. So parents always have this illusion that they're raising their children absolutely the same. Total delusion. 
it is not true. No parent can ever, 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 after being with me, ever say that again. Because it's impossible, right? Just like I'm different with every client, the minute they walk in, I'm different. The minute they sigh, I'm different. The minute they open their mouth, I'm different. They shape me and I shape them in indelible, inscrutable ways. We cannot scrutinize it. It's in the energy. So please, if you're, if you're a parent of siblings or, or many, multiple children or have been one of many siblings, please know you were treated very differently. Please know you're treating your children very differently. And please know that is a fact and that is normal. <laughs> to think that you're treating them the same is some bullshit delusion that all parents like to drink the Kool-Aid off, okay? How can you treat, and you, you can't treat anyone the same. You, you can't even treat yourself the same after 10 minutes. So accepting that is wisdom. <laughs> you know, there's nothing to fight about. Nobody was raised the same as their siblings and nobody raises siblings in the same way. Done. Okay, so accepting that, that we cannot compare, we cannot uh, bemoan, we cannot exalt others compared to us. We need to own our life script, own your narrative. What does owning your narrative mean? That's where my book comes in. I know I'm plugging the book, but what to do? I'm here because of the damn book, okay? So in this book, A Radical Awakening, which I love, it's my favorite book that I've written, I outline the steps to first become aware that you're asleep which means to become aware that you've been in some horrendous bloody movie, okay? No, really, in a movie. I first realized I was in a movie when I left India and came to America at 21. And things were so different here, it was 1993, and it was so diff things were so different here that I was like, where have I been living till now? And just the difference made me pop my bubble that where I had been living was not the whole story. It was just one rendition, one iteration, one version of someone's movie. So when you, when you come to a new country, when you're young, it's a beautiful thing because you really pop your bubbles and you are disoriented. And those were the days without iPhones, without email. I don't, I don't believe we had email. I had like a electronic typewriter where you have paper, you put in every a paper each time and you crumble it and throw it in the waste paper basket. I mean, that's when I came to America. I barely talked to my parents, sent snail mail, right? So the, the culture shock is so fascinating. And now we've removed that culture shock for our children. I know I digress, but for a moment, we've taken away culture shock. Culture shock is an amazing damn thing. But because now everyone is so connected and everyone is on every social media platform, when my child goes to a new country, she's like, oh, I've seen this on TikTok. I've seen this on Instagram. I've seen this on my virtual reality headset. Okay, so sad and tragic that we're doing this. I know it's lovely and I love those virtual reality headsets, but honestly, it's really sad because we've taken away the, the culture shock. Why is culture shock so good? Why is any shock so good? Why is any painful shock so good? Because it makes you realize that you were living in a freaking movie. Okay, that's why when somebody gets the news of terminal illness, they are shaken up. Why? Because they were in the culture that they wouldn't get a terminal illness. So now they're in a culture shock. So any sort of culture shock is so good because it rips you apart and makes you drop all your known defense mechanisms, all your coping goes. Right. So when I came to America, I had all these ideas and now I realized that none of them work. So travel is phenomenal. Dropping your kid in the middle of nowhere in the unknown is phenomenal because every one of us needs to wake up out of our conditioning, out of our movie, right? So the first step is becoming aware that you've been asleep. The next step is now waking up. So waking up means what? Means realizing that we've been living a script. Whose script? Our parents' script and our culture script. And we're terrified of dropping the script. In fact, we didn't even know till we read a book like A Radical Awakening that, oh, we're supposed to be dropping the script. <laughs> we, we are supposed to be recognizing ourselves in the mirror. Who said that, right? And then when you begin to notice the mask, you see it everywhere. <laughs> and the most amazing thing about the mask, 
It's bloody super glued onto your face. Try taking out your mask. You think, ah, I am a bleeding empath on page whatever or page 108. I'm a perfectionist. Try taking out the mask. It's one thing to know it. It's another thing to take it out. Taking it out, yanking it out means literally chopping your head off, okay? <laughs> you need to chop your head off, which means then you're unrecognizable. And till the new head bulb grows, people are going to look at you like, where is your head? Where did you go? Right? Hello. Did you kill Shafali? Did you kill Samantha? Yes. You have to kill the whole self. Because all that comes with that bullshit mask needs to go. And this is where the rubber meets the road and stops. So people have been reading my book and they love it till part three. And after part two, they literally write reviews. Suddenly, the book was very promising and it was lovely. And then suddenly Dr. Shivali lost her shit. Because I talk about sexuality, I talk about changing the matrix, right? And I talk about changing yourself. People stop reading the book after page 151. I've told you at 151, it becomes really provocative, apparently. So apparently, yes. So people stop. So this is where the real work begins. Now you've realized you've been asleep. Now you've seen your patterns, which I talk about in part two, but now you have to do something about it. And in order to do something about it, you have to grow new parts of yourself. How to grow new parts of yourself? Part of the growing is first cleaning out the junk. You have to clean out the shitty weeds, okay? And then put nice shitty manure for new things to grow. But first take out the old dried manure. That takes excavation. You got to go see a therapist or a coach. You can come see some of my coaches in my coaching institute. I have amazing coaches. Anyway, so you can go see a therapist or a coach and begin to excavate out the bad weeds, right? The, the, the dying weeds, the dying soil. And part of that process means really understanding what crap your mom put in, what crap your dad put in, what crap your siblings put in, what crap your teachers put in, what crap your friends put in, what crap culture puts in through race, politics, wealth, status, beauty, all those ideas. And in part four, I break those ideas. I help you. So this is the process towards reclamation of the self. On the journey, is a lot of aloneness. You're going to be alone. And aloneness terrifies people. I posted on Instagram a whole slew of postcards how people mistake aloneness for loneliness. And the two are two completely different things. You need aloneness. It's a vital superpower. It is the only way to go through the tunnel of burning hell to come out on the other side of transformation. Loneliness is a feeling that emerges from a belief that we are not amazingly valuable to ourselves as others. This idea comes from culture. Culture tells you, oh, you're alone. You did, you were alone all weekend. You don't feel lonely, right? <laughs> when I got my, when I, when I went through my divorce, that's it. Everyone started pairing me up. Oh, now we have to find you somebody. Uh, why? Right? What is this idea that we need to be coupled up? Right? We must be alone in order to know who it is you are. This is a vital ingredient of the evolution process. So being alone has nothing to do with loneliness. It has to do with connecting to yourself. Now, if you're alone under the sheets in a dark room, that is not being alone. That is being in depression that is actually being disconnected from yourself. Aloneness means rediscovering your vital connection to yourself. Going, what does, if your name is Samantha, what does Samantha love to do? What does Michael love to do? And then feeding Samantha and Michael with that food, nurturing Samantha and Michael's mind, ignoring people, 
stay away from people during this transformation process because people are the problem. <laughs> you want to just reclaim yourself. You want to re energize yourself with things that make you bountiful, you abundant, you joyful. You have to seriously go on a path where you seriously know yourself, not just which shampoo you like and which kind of, uh, you know, movies you like to watch. That is not knowing yourself. That is again, distracting yourself, disconnected from yourself. True knowledge of the self is what fills me up deeply. What gives me joy deeply? Who am I? And learning to be with yourself, learning to be with yourself. So making it a practice when you go on a run or a walk or you're in bed, don't pull out the screen. You know, I, when I go running, I do not listen to much. Very rarely, maybe once in 30, 40 days, I'll put on a podcast. But for the most part, I use that time to get into my breath, to hear my own junk because I need to declutter my own crap that has accumulated during the night. So I let myself run with my thoughts. I observe my thoughts. I do a running meditation. At night, I do a sitting meditation. All day, I do a meditation. I personally don't put on a TV, don't put on Netflix. It takes a lot for me to watch Netflix. I will mostly be by myself. Because all day I'm with people and helping people, so I need to recenter. If you don't prioritize this recentering, you will not fortify your connection with yourself. You will simply numb yourself through food, through alcohol, through screens, through things, and not even realize that you are actually disconnected from yourself. Now, does this mean I'll never watch a movie? I don't, I'm such a boring person. By the way, a lot of people come to me and go, Dr. Shivali, are you a boring person? And I say, yes, I am. <laughs> I am. To a lot of people, I'm completely boring. Because what they like, I don't like. Sorry, I don't like it. So know who you are, claim who you are, and don't buy into the stereotype of what others want you to be. But spending time alone, I promise you, is not boring. It's vital, it's resuscitation of the soul. And if you don't spend time with yourself and don't hear your own heartbeat and don't listen to the junk in your own mind, that junk will pervertedly projectile vomit itself onto dogs, cats, your children, your body and your lovers and your friends. Processing and metabolizing means to be in solitude, means to listen to yourself. If you think you're boring and different, you can come for my next conference, Evolve. <laughs> it is filled with boring and different people. You know, I, I do it once a year. I'm not doing it this year and I didn't do it last year, but I'm gonna do it next year. You can come for it. I haven't decided when, but it'll be there. And it's a very boring con uh, conference compared to what other people have. Because I don't have music and pomp and show and distraction. I have a welcome to yourself conference, a let's sit in silence and get to know who the hell you are conference. Uh, you're a hazard to yourself. Now can you get out of your way conference, right? So that's my kind of conference, but people find it boring, but a lot of people come. Anyway, so I want you today, uh, help you understand what this reclamation of self looks like. It looks like a bold reunion with yourself. It means solitude, but not distraction, not numbing. That is bullshit. You can be alone and you're like, I'm alone, Dr. Shifali. No, you're not. If you're not with yourself and you're distracting yourself, you can be on your own and eating two huge big pies of pizza. No, you're not on your own. You are lost to yourself. You're numbing with food. Or you can be on your own and binge watch Netflix. Yeah, you're on your own, but that's not the aloneness I'm talking about. I'm not talking about how many people are in the room with you. I'm talking about, are you connected to yourself? That's what I'm talking about. Aloneness means entering the state of reunion with your solitude, loving the quiet to reclaim yourself. Very difficult for this culture that we've grown up in that has made us so addicted to noise, right? 
I have so many friends who have the TV on non-stop, right? It's just, it's because it's become an addiction, right? It, we, I have so many friends who eat non-stop, talk non-stop, gossip non-stop, scream non-stop. My daughter, 18 year old, on the phone non-stop. What to do, right? This is a culture that has become insanely, insatiably addicted to being distracted. So I have many, many courses to help you reclaim the self. I have free meditations. It'll all be posted very soon next week. Today is uh, Friday. I think by Monday, all my courses are going on 50% sale. I have free meditations. I have meditation courses. I have growth courses, relationship courses, parenting courses. So I'm preparing everything for this big blowout sale. We'll go on sale probably on Monday. Take these courses 50% off. Really reasonable. Hours and hours, 50 hours of coursework. And start reclaiming yourself. So if you're playing the guitar, but you're using that to connect to yourself, that's different than watching Netflix. Netflix has no connection to yourself. I go walking to connect to myself. You're playing guitar to connect to yourself. That's not a distraction, right? Now, if you're playing guitar to win the next guitar competition, then you're not connected to yourself. So part of reclaiming yourself means to spend time in solitude and to truly know who it is you are. No matter what someone else says you are, you are your own best lover, friend, ally, mate, partner, child, parent, right? You may not be someone else's good match. You may not be a match for someone else. And that's okay. You know, you're not so special that you need to be everybody's match. Accepting that the, you're not their match. And guess what? They may not be your match is the way to go. So part of this work is deep reunion with yourself, deep connection with yourself, right? And, and deeply loving yourself as you're alone. And the culture tells you that alone is bad. Enter that space of connection, enter that space of deep union, start recognizing who it is you are, start the process. It's a long, decades long, eons long journey, but begin now. Start the process of entering who it is you are. And keep reading the book. Buy the book, A Radical Awakening. I will see you for the next book club when I do. Bye, guys.